In the late 1800s, the Chicago Times Herald wrote, He is a prodigy of wickedness, a human demon, a being so unthinkable that no novelist would dare to invent such a character. The individual they were referring to was H. H. Holmes, a man so despicable that he designed his own murder castle. This is the serial killer's twisted and terrifying tale early life. The first thing you need to know about H. H. Holmes is that his real name is not H. H. Holmes. As an expert con man, he went under a number of aliases. His real name is Herman Webster Mudgett, and he was born in 1861 in Gilmanton, New Hampshire. He was born into a wealthy family and showed early promise in school. He demonstrated an interest in medicine and was destined to become a doctor. He conducted experiments with animals as a child, which is where things get a bit more sinister. He's said to be fascinated by skeletons and also fascinated by death. At 16 years old, Holmes met his high school sweetheart, Clara Lovering, who was also the daughter of a wealthy family. They had a son together in 1880. He attended medical school at the University of Michigan, where his behavior became even more sinister. As a medical student, he now had access to cadavers and started experimenting on them too. He also used these bodies to commit insurance fraud. It is rumored that Holmes stole cadavers from the school, burned or disfigured their bodies, and made it look like they'd been involved in an accident. Holmes would take out an insurance policy for these bodies and place the key benefactor as himself. He also used other bodies taken from graves and morgues to commit the same fraud. Holmes' graduation coincided with Clara having enough of him and leaving him forever. He was rumored to be violent towards Clara, so she left with her son and moved back to New Hampshire. Holmes, meanwhile, moved to the Windy City of Chicago. The Windy City. In 1886, Holmes got a job as a pharmacist in Chicago and worked under Dr. Edward Holton. When the owner passed away, the running of the store was left to his wife, Julia Connor. However, Holmes convinced the widow that he could run the pharmacy by himself. There were rumors that Holmes and Julia had an affair. What we can be certain of is that Julia and her daughter Pearl went missing, with Holmes claiming that she moved to California. This gave Holmes full control of the pharmacy. Christmas of 1891 was the last time that Julia Connor was seen alive. A few months later, Holmes hired a local man to remove the skin of a corpse of an unusually tall woman, which was to be sold to a medical school. Coincidentally, Julia was six feet tall. Holmes soon married his second wife, Myrta Belknap. This is despite the fact that Holmes and Clara had never officially divorced. He operated this job under the name Dr. Henry H. Holmes. He was apparently a big fan of Sherlock Holmes, except it wasn't the solving of crimes that he was interested in. When running his pharmacy, he curiously got all of his employees to take out life insurance. As their employer, he agreed to pay for all the premiums too. On the surface, this looked like an overly cautious decision, and this move invited even more more suspicion when he made them put his name as the beneficiary. That way, if supposedly one of them died, Holmes would make a lot of money for himself. Holmes was also a serial womanizer. He was a hopeless romantic, and would also get his partners to take out life insurance too, and, as you have guessed, make himself the prime benefactor as well. No Moral Code Eric Larson, who wrote the book The Devil in the White City about Holmes, said that he had absolutely no moral code, and this made him an incredible liar and manipulator. If you or I told a lie, we might show signs of nervousness or anxiousness where our moral code tries to trip us up. Without this code, Holmes had free reign to lie about whatever he wanted. Um, it's a very powerful position to be in because you can do anything, and that's why he got away with it. You can, you can convince anyone of anything because you don't have that sort of moral break that allows people to detect deception. Do you know what I mean? You're just, you're just openly bad. For Holmes, killing was as normal as hailing a cab. You and I would, would, would you know, in any sort of business deal, would like to, I, I like to think we would think about the ethical consequences and, and you know, was this a good thing or a bad thing. Nothing like that ever entered this man's brain. He just, he was just reacted to situations, and if it took murder to do this, well, fine, it's, it's like getting into a cab, you know. C.E. Davis, who was hired by Holmes to run his jewelry counter, said, Holmes used to tell me he had a lawyer paid to keep him out of trouble, but it always seemed to me that it was the courteous, audacious rascality of the fellow that pulled him through. He was the only man in the United States that could do what he did. During his time, his ideal victims were attractive women from wealthy families. When John Bartlow Martin wrote about Holmes for Harper's Magazine, he said, almost without exception, his victims appear to have had two things in common, beauty and money. They lost both. One of the biggest slaves to his deception was Emmeline Sigrande, the ladies' man. While running his pharmacy in Chicago, Holmes became good friends with a man named Benjamin Peitzel. Peitzel suffered from alcoholism and visited a doctor in Dwight, Illinois, 
for treatment, where it was believed that someone had a drug that could cure his addiction. He came back and told Holmes that the secretary at his doctor's office was one of the most beautiful women he had ever seen. Based on these credentials, Holmes wrote to Sagrande and offered her a job as his secretary and stenographer. He offered her twice her current salary, and she accepted it. When she worked for him, he would buy her gifts and try to court her. Holmes said that anyone who spoke ill of him was just jealous of his success. He also convinced her that he was the son of a British lord. He had no moral code, so he could lie to her with ease. And don't forget, he was supposedly a happily married man while all of this was taking place. Gradually, she weakened herself to his advances and soon became his mistress. What happened afterward remains a mystery. Emmeline's parents received a letter explaining that she had run off with a man named Robert Phelps. However, Robert Phelps never existed. This was believed to be a forged letter and forged by someone who was very familiar with Emmeline's handwriting. Emmeline would not be the last woman to disappear. This was the dawn of the modern era where women had more and more independence. This meant that women were traveling alone and pursuing their own careers, and people like Holmes would take advantage of this new phenomenon. And in the coming years, Chicago would become one of the most exciting places in the world to live. The World's Fair in 1893, Chicago was set to hold the World's Fair, which coincided with the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus' historic voyage across the Atlantic Ocean. Hosting this event in Chicago certainly raised a lot of eyebrows. New York and Philadelphia were seen as the more suitable cities, and this was Chicago's chance to prove itself on the world stage. Four years earlier, Paris had held the World's Fair and chose this event to introduce a little-known building known as the Eiffel Tower. Millions of people across the world were coming, and Paris had set the bar incredibly high for what was expected. With so many people coming to visit the Windy City, Holmes proposed the idea of building his own hotel. The city needed as much accommodation as it could get, so this gave Holmes the perfect opportunity to finance its construction and receive loans and investments. In fact, there were no builders or architects that could tell exactly what was in this building. The only person who knew the full ins and outs of the building was H. H. Holmes. Essentially, Holmes continuously hired and fired workers throughout their construction. In this way, nobody would have a clear outlook of his exact plans. Furthermore, he could also accuse the workers of bad workmanship and refuse to pay for their services. The future caretaker of the building was an Irish immigrant named Patrick Quinlan. Quinlan helped Holmes build some of the trap doors and helped line some of the rooms with asbestos, but never questioned why these might be needed. In fairness to Quinlan, he may have thought that his boss was a con man, but nothing more. These trap doors and passageways were used to hide furniture when his creditors came calling. Holmes bought all of the furniture on credit and then just didn't pay any of his bills. When men arrived to repossess this furniture, they simply couldn't be found. On one occasion, a furniture removal man walked into the building and found it completely empty. But it became clear that these hidden rooms and passageways had a much worse motive behind them. As John Bartlow Martin explained, the castle had swallowed the furniture as later it would swallow human beings. The castle. There were 35 small, windowless rooms. There were also stairways and doors that led absolutely nowhere. There were peepholes where Holmes could see how their victims were doing and also soundproofed rooms where their screams would not be heard. The building soon became known as Murder Castle. Down in the basement is where Holmes would put his medical degree to good use. There was a dissecting table where he would examine bodies, as he did with animals in his youth. He could now dissect and experiment with human skeletons. Once he was finished with this, there was a crematorium where he could burn the bodies into ashes. There was also acid he could use to dissolve them too. Upon completion, Holmes placed adverts for staff and lodgers. He also placed an advert that he was a wealthy bachelor and looking for a wife. Again, all of the employees were also curiously forced to take out life insurance policies. While the place was billed as a new and exciting hotel in Chicago, this was all a ruse. Adam Selzer, author of H. H. Holmes, The True History of the White City Devil, said, When he added a third floor onto his building in 1892, he told people it was going to be a hotel space, but it was never finished or furnished or open to the public. The whole idea was just a vehicle to swindle suppliers and investors and insurers. With a new business on the way, Holmes needed new employees, and with more employees came even more disappearances. A new secretary. Winnie Williams was an aspiring actress and had offered to be Holmes' personal secretary. Holmes got wind of the fact that she owned property in Fort Worth and agreed to hire her. Holmes characteristically tried to charm and woo the secretary once again, and once again she was smitten by this man. She was so enchanted that she signed over the Fort Worth property to him. Holmes and Minnie presented themselves as husband and wife and rented an apartment together, and it's not abundantly clear what his actual wife made of this. After years of waiting, the World's Fair had finally arrived, and Minnie invited her sister Nanny over to Chicago to witness the historical event. For many people of this time, this would be the first time they saw things like automobiles, hamburgers, hot dogs, electric lighting, and moving pictures. To rival France's new Eiffel Tower, Chicago introduced a brand new structure that was never seen before. They commissioned George Washington Gale Ferris, who designed the first ever Ferris wheel. This fair was a gateway into what the 20th century would look like, and it only cost you 50 cents to enter. The fair's inspirational architect, Daniel Burham, famously said, make no little plans. They have no magic to stir man's blood, and probably themselves will not be realized. This level of ambition was also being driven by a man across the other side of the city, but with much darker aims. A Cowardly Killer 
For Eric Larson, he saw that this was a time when one incredibly optimistic event was happening at the same time as something incredibly dark and disturbing. Of this heroic act of civic goodwill, the World's Fair and the effort to build it, the, the, the tremendous um, odds against effort to build it. And in the same place, at the same time, this killer using this fair to do his, his equally outstanding work at killing. Nanny was excited to see the World's Fair, but also to see her sister and the man she had spoken so fondly of. Little did she know that prior to her letters, circumstances had changed. When her train arrived from Texas to Chicago, only Holmes was there to meet her at the station. When they finally reached her home, Holmes took her into his home and showed Nanny his true colors. He took all of her money and pushed her into an airtight vault in the building, one where she would suffocate to death. As for Minnie, Holmes had chloroformed her while she was sleeping and threw her body into a cellar. According to Larson, this was his main method of killing. And as that such, he was sort of a cowardly killer. He was not the kind of person who would go up behind somebody and slit their throats or something like that. His preferred weapon was, was chloroform in a rag, an overdose of chloroform, um, gas injected into a room, that kind of thing. A change of scenery. Once the World's Fair ended, the economy of Chicago hit a slump. Nobody was coming to the hotel anymore, so he needed to find money through alternative methods. On August 13th, 1893, part of the hotel suspiciously went on fire. All of the people inside managed to escape. By this time, Holmes had possibly gained himself a reputation. He took out insurance for the building with four companies, but instead of paying out, all four of them decided to sue him for arson. The last thing Holmes needed was a lawsuit on his hands, or the possibility of the police looking into his activities. Whatever the case, he decided to move away from the Windy City. Holmes essentially traveled across America committing scams. He went to Fort Worth and tried to build property on the land he acquired after the death of Minnie Williams. In 1893, Holmes was arrested for insurance fraud. It was alleged that he set off a fire at a home to collect insurance money, but he was released soon after his arrest. Whether this fire was a fraud or not, he had a much more elaborate scheme underway. While in jail, he became acquainted with Marion Hedgepath, who knew a corrupt lawyer named Jephthah Howe. Holmes planned to fake the death of his good friend Ben Peitzel and get a $10,000 dollar claim, which at that time was a life-changing amount of money. Holmes would split the money with Peitzel, and he would also give $500 to Hedgepath in exchange for providing him with a lawyer, and in exchange for his silence on the matter. As a newly free man, he also married his third wife, Georgiana Yoke. This despite the fact that he had not divorced his first two wives. To fake Peitzel's death, Holmes would use a cadaver that he could source from a medical school. Peitzel was a pharmacist and amateur inventor, so they would arrange so that he was engaged in some chemical experiment and died in an explosion. They simply had to create the explosion and have the cadaver at the scene of the crime. A change of plans. Upon his release, Heitzel had quite a surprise in store for him. He knew that Holmes was a fraudster, but believed that this was the extent of his evil. He had no idea the lengths he would go to to commit such crimes. Heitzel was murdered by Holmes, primarily so Holmes could keep the life insurance money all to himself. After the killing, Holmes simply told Heitzel's wife Carrie that her husband had gone into hiding. Holmes told the unknowingly widowed woman, He's safe in Canada. He had me frame up this body. It's so badly mangled by the explosion that no one can ever recognize it. You identify it and we'll get the insurance. Your husband said for me to give you half and bring the other half to him. Carrie was desperately ill and needed the insurance money. In fact, she was so ill that she sent her 15-year-old daughter Alice to identify the body. Like the many women before her, Carrie really trusted Holmes and saw him as a close friend of her husband's. After Alice identified the body, the teenager was placed temporarily in Holmes's care. Her other two children, Nellie and Howard, were also sent to live with Holmes in the hopes that they would meet up with their father too. This was also lightening the load for Carrie, who was now living with her eldest daughter and a baby they recently had. While this was happening, something else was afoot. Back in his chair, cell, Marion Hedgepath was upset that he had received not a penny from Holmes at this point. He had not kept his end of the deal, so Marion wasn't going to keep his either. He decided to tell the police about Holmes and his antics. When police spoke to the lawyer Jephthah Howe, he explained that Holmes had actually killed Benjamin Peitzel. Pot on his tail. The police first found Carrie and were distraught that she had given custody of three of her children to this murderous man on the run. Holmes had traveled from town to town with these three children, each time promising them that they would one day meet with their father. At every town and every train ride, they were given another promise that they meet their father. However, Carrie's eight-year-old son had asked too many questions. When they stopped in Indiana, Holmes rented a home and brought Howard in on his own. It was between these four walls that he poisoned him, cut him up, and burnt his body. It was the second member of the Peitzel family that he killed. He feared that there might be more too. After a 
lengthy search for Holmes, the police finally caught up with him. He was arrested in Boston. For Detective Frank Gaya, who had been following him across the US, they had finally got their man. However, 15-year-old Alice and Nellie Peitzel were nowhere to be found. Toronto was the last place these two girls were seen, and police were tipped off to a quaint little cottage where they might be located. Nobody was inside, but knowing Holmes, he may have concealed this evidence. Detective Gaya gave a chilling description of what happened next. The deeper we dug, the more horrible the odor became. When we reached the depth of three feet, we discovered what happened to be the bone of the forearm of a human being. There were no injuries, and it's suspected that he allowed a gas valve to leak inside the room and caused them to suffocate to death. It was a trademark Holmes murder. The trial. With Holmes arrested, he was questioned. Initially, he pleaded innocent and decided to represent himself rather than get his own attorney. He was caught in Pennsylvania, but Illinois and Toronto also wanted to extradite him. However, Pennsylvania would be the last state that he would set foot in. He was found guilty and set to be executed. After he lost his appeal, Holmes started confessing more and more to the police and the media. Through the Philadelphia Inquirer, he admitted to killing 27 people. However, Holmes, after all, is a con man, so his own testimony is not the most reliable source either. Adam Selzer said, there's a total of about nine people that we can say with some confidence he probably killed. He confessed to 27 at one point, but several of them were still alive at that time. Many of the bodies they found were so badly dismembered and disguised that it was difficult to put an exact figure on how many he killed. Another contested tale is his cremation of the bodies downstairs. Many have argued that you simply couldn't cremate bodies with a wood-burning stove he had down in the basement. Howard Schechter, who wrote the book Depraved on Schechter, said, It's my belief that probably all those stories about all these visitors to the World's Fair who were murdered in his quote quote, castle, were just complete sensationalistic fabrication by the yellow press. Holmes was clearly very fond of women. However, Schechter argues that Holmes was not motivated by any form of sadism, but pure financial greed. I do believe that Holmes was driven primarily by greed. And of course, in that sense, it's what made him so fascinating, so appalling. When the press was alerted to what Holmes had done, there was never anything like it's seen before. He's often considered America's first serial killer. The reality is that he was one of the earliest. Like Jack the Ripper in London, he's associated with local law and mythology too. In newspapers, they were quick to make things up and never let the truth get in the way of a good story. The media lies. When researching Holmes, Schechter came across multiple sources where the newspapers later admitted that some of the stories were untrue. Be a big front page headline human rib cage found in the castle of home in the basement of holmes's castle and then two days later on page 20 you know in a little thing on the bottom you would say you know investigators have discovered that the rib cage was really you know a bunch of wood and holmes didn't shy away from the limelight either and his greed for humans had not faded from him yet he was paid seven and a half thousand dollars by the hearst newspapers for his confession so i hear you ask what does a soon-to-be hanged man want this amount of money for one of the peculiar niceties about holmes is that he continued to financially support his first wife and their child this money would apparently go to them on the other side of the coin this confession would also give him the ego boost of becoming famous as one of america's worst killers holmes himself would simultaneously exaggerate and downplay his capacity to kill in one quote he said i was born with a devil in me i could not help the fact that I was a murderer. No more than a poet can help the inspiration to sing. In another, he said, to have planned and executed the stupendous amount of wrongdoing that has been attributed to me would have been wholly beyond my power. At death's door. Whatever the case, Holmes was convicted of nine killings, and when the dust settled, it was time to face the music. Before his hanging, Holmes requested that his coffin should be contained in cement and that he could be buried 10 feet deep. He audaciously didn't want people digging up his grave. At 10.12 a.m., Holmes was hanged at Moya Mensing County Jail. His neck was broken by the fall, and he was not pronounced dead until half an hour later. A reporter for the Chicago Sun remarked how he was surprisingly calm when he arrived at death's door. Without an instant delay, his hands were bound behind him and the black cap adjusted. Sheriff Olamant placed the noose about his neck, and after an instant of terrible stillness, the crack of the bolt rang out like a pistol shot, and the man had fallen to his doom. The marvelous nerve of the man never deserted him to the end. Even on the scaffold, he was probably the coolest person in the solemn assemblage. Holmes Murder Castle was eventually demolished and taken down, on the original site in the Englewood branch of the United States Postal Service. Caretaker Patrick Quinlan was forever known as the caretaker of Murder Castle. There was nothing charged against him, but it seems like he was eaten away from the guilt of not sussing out what was going on, and not questioning any of the highly questionable behavior from his employer. He did, in fact, help him devise the trap doors Holmes used for his murders. In 1919, caretaker Patrick Quinlan took his own life. He poisoned himself and left a note saying, I could not sleep. A twisted legacy. 
Despite dying in the 19th century, one myth continued to surround him through the years for many decades. People have wondered why he wanted his body buried beneath cement. He obviously didn't want people doing what he did to many others, but there could be other reasons. This man, after all, was a convicted fraudster, so it was unwise to take him at his word. This led to a conspiracy theory that the person they hung was not actually H. H. Holmes. As early as 2017, H. H. Holmes' body was dug up for testing. Because of the cement, his body had not naturally decomposed, and even his moustache was still intact. They used his teeth to identify that this was in fact H. H. Holmes, and could put that mystery to rest. Holmes may have lied about many things, but it was his body that was hanged and buried on that fateful day. The World Fair, set by Daniel Burham, left a lasting legacy. For the revelers who traveled to the fair in the Windy City, they caught an early glimpse into the 20th century life. Across the city, H. H. Holmes had become one of America's earliest serial killers, and was unknowingly also shaping what was yet to come in the modern world. Thank you so much for watching. Please click on the videos you see in front of you now for more. See you there.